Thank you for the introduction. Hello, my name is Ruth Wolf, and I'm a Principal Field Application Scientist with Perkin Elmer. Welcome to our Masterclass webinar on understanding matrix interferences in ICPMS and strategies for dealing with them. Here are some of our learning goals for today's webinar. First, we will review the processes in the plasma because understanding these is a key to identifying and resolving matrix interferences. We also want to take a look at what types of results would indicate you have a potential matrix interference. Next, we want to give you a few tools in how to test for matrix interferences and hopefully resolve them. And finally, we should have enough time to be able to answer some of your questions. So let's take a minute and talk about what an ICP is. ICP stands for inductively coupled plasma. In the ICP, typically argon gas is ionized for the plasma discharge, which is a collection of positive ions and electrons. In order to form and sustain the plasma, an RF field is applied to the load coil or plates, which causes an oscillating AC current. This in turn causes electric and magnetic fields at the top of the ICP torch to remove electrons from the argon gas and ionize it. The argon ICP has a temperature of about 10,000 degrees centigrade and can ionize most elements in the periodic table. In ICPMS, the goal is to convert all of your analyte atoms to ions in the plasma so they can be measured and related to the concentration of the element in your solution. There are a few reasons for getting seemingly wrong results in ICPMS. Besides obvious analytical or user errors, such as incorrect calibration standards and sample carryover, the most often reason is the presence of an interference. Interferences are classified as either spectroscopic or non-spectroscopic or matrix interferences. Although spectroscopic interferences are not the subject of today's presentation, you should know that there are ways to correct, avoid, or eliminate them. These include careful mass selection for your analyses or using the universal cell on your Nexian ICPMS to remove them using either KED or DRC modes. The focus of our talk today is non-spectroscopic or so-called matrix interferences. Matrix interferences generally involve some sort of effect by concomitant elements present in the sample that either cause mass independent signal enhancements or suppression due to changes in the plasma characteristics that affect ionization. In ICPMS, there are also mass dependent interferences due to effects classified as space charge interferences. In today's webinar, we will be talking about both of these in detail. In order to troubleshoot method problems that may be caused by matrix interferences, you need to understand the processes occurring in the plasma. The first function of the high temperature plasma is to remove the solvent or to desolvate the sample, leaving it as microscopic salt particles. This happens as the aerosol droplet passes from the injector into the plasma and in the lowest part of the plasma. Some of this process actually begins in the spray chamber and is greatly affected by the size of the aerosol droplets produced by the nebulizer, which is why your nebulizer and spray chamber selection are so important. The next step is vaporization of the salt particles into a gas of individual molecules. These molecules are then dissociated into atoms. The atomization process occurs predominantly in the preheating zone or the lower part of the plasma. The plasma has two functions remaining. These functions are excitation and ionization and occur predominantly in the initial radiation zone and the normal analytical zone of the plasma. The normal analytical zone of the plasma can be distinguished by the regions where the atomic and ionic emissions occur. In this figure, we are aspirating a high concentration yttrium standard and the atomic emission zone can be seen as the red bullet area. In ICPMS, we are focused on the production of ions, which occurs in the ionic emission zone shown by the blue emission and the blue circle. In this figure, the dashed yellow line shows the top of the quartz ICP torch and the green arrow shows the sampler cone orifice. The distance between the sampler orifice and the torch is called the sampling depth. 
It is important to understand that in ICPMS, we are detecting only the ions formed in the plasma. So if a matrix interference affects ion formation, we will have issues with our results. Basically, matrix interferences in ICPMS affect the plasma processes of nebulization, desolvation, vaporization, dissociation, and ionization somehow. All of these processes require energy and time. Studies have shown it takes a droplet about 12 milliseconds to travel, travel through the plasma. So anything that would affect the rate or completeness of these processes can cause a non-spectral or a matrix interference. Most, or about 85%, of all significant interferences occur during the nebulization step due to changes in the sample viscosity, surface tension, and density of your solutions. This is why you should matrix match as closely as possible to get the best accuracy in your results. Keep in mind that ICPMS is a comparative technique. You have to run blanks and standards to calibrate the instrument. The sample result is calculated by comparing the sample intensity to that of the calibration curve. It is critical that your signals are stable and reproducible. Because matrix interferences can change the slope of your calibration curve, matching your calibration standard matrix to your sample matrix, matrix is essential for getting the most accurate results. If your sample matrix is much different than that of your calibration standards and you have a matrix interference present, this can lead to inaccurate results. Matrix effects change the instrument response or sensitivity in some way due to the presence of a concomitant element also present in the sample. One way to test for a matrix interference is to compare the sensitivity with and without the matrix present. If the ratio is significantly different than one or 100% recovery, you probably have a matrix interference. Matrix interferences can be distinguished whether the suppression or enhancement is uniform across the mass range or if it is mass dependent. If the interference is mass dependent, space charge effects can be a major contributor to the interference and we will talk about these in more detail later in the presentation. So let's step back a moment. A critical part of your ICPMS's sample introduction system is the peristaltic pump. You may ask, why do we use a peristaltic pump in the first place? Although many of the nebulizers used in ICPMS are concentric nebulizers, such as Meinhardt or Sea Spray nebulizers, and will self-aspirate, the use of a peristaltic pump is to ensure a constant regulated flow of the sample to the nebulizer. The use of a peristaltic pump minimizes the effects of sample viscosity on sample uptake rate. Poussel's law for laminar flow, shown by the equation on the slide describes the factors that influence liquid flow through an open tube. What is important to remember is that the flow rate is inversely proportional to tubing length and viscosity. The chart at the right shows the viscosities of several common liquids. Note how the viscosity is also temperature dependent. Using that chart and interpolating a bit, let's say your lab temperature goes from 70 degrees to 85 degrees during a warm summer day. If you were self-aspirating, your sample flow rate could change by nearly 15%, leading to an inaccurate result. Or if you prepare your calibration curve using room temperature standards and then analyze your samples, which were stored under refrigeration without, without allowing them to warm up, the sample flow rate could change by more than 50% due to the viscosity difference between the room temperature water and the water at four degrees centigrade. And just because you are pumping your sample to the nebulizer doesn't mean you are entirely safe from problems. Worn or improperly tensioned pump tubing can also lead to flow rate changes and inaccurate results if things change between the time you can ran your calibration standards and when you run your samples. It is very common to use internal standards in ICPMS to compensate for changes in sample delivery over time due to wear in your peristaltic pump tubing, partial clogging of the nebulizer or interface cones, or changes in your sample viscosity. When selecting your internal standard element, be aware that it should not already be present in your standards or samples in any significant concentration. The use of an internal standard cannot correct for all types of matrix interferences. You should understand the limitations of an internal standard, and I will show you some examples of how internal standard selection can affect your results.
Most production labs use online mixing of the internal standards using a mixing tea of some sort, such as those shown on the right. You can individually spike samples, but this can be time consuming if you have a lot of samples, and it can lead to errors if you are using small, less than 50 microliter spike volumes and are not pipetting correctly. You can also potentially miss a sample or double spike a sample. You also need to maintain or replace worn or contaminated teas. And be aware of the material used in your mixing tea and the potential for contamination. Some mixing teas are made of glass and can cause contamination for elements such as boron, sodium, silicon, calcium, and magnesium, and other elements if you are looking for these at low levels, and generally I would not recommend using a glass mixing tea for ICPMS. You also want a mixing tea with a low dead volume to avoid sample carryover, and you should replace them periodically as they can become contaminated over time by high levels of elements present in your samples. Finally, you need to ensure that the sample flow and the internal standard flow are mixing properly. What you should look for here is RSDs for your internal standard replicates that are less than 1 to 2 percent. If the RSDs are higher, you should suspect that your internal standard and your sample are not mixing properly, or you should look for air bubbles entrained in the, one of the two lines. High RSDs in your internal standard results will cause more error in your analytical results. Let's talk a little bit about what happens to your sample and or internal standard once it gets to the nebulizer. The picture on the right is a schematic of a typical concentric style nebulizer where the sample comes up through the center capillary and the nebulizer gas comes out of the concentric ring or annulus around the sample carillon capillary. As the gas escapes from the annulus at a high velocity, it creates an area of reduced pressure which draws the liquid through the central capillary. This is why concentric nebulizers will self-aspirate. The high velocity of the nebulizer gas shears the liquid coming up the sample capillary into a fine mist of aerosol droplets. If you hold your nebulizer against a dark background, you should be able to see the mist or the aerosol being formed. There has been a lot of study of what happens to these aerosol droplets in the ICP. These studies are done using a variety of methods including laser Doppler radar. First, as the aerosol droplet enters the spray chamber, the larger droplets are removed by colliding with the spray chamber walls and are taken out of the spray chamber through the drain. This is about 95-98% to 98 of all the droplets created by the nebulizer. The smaller droplets start to desolvate and water evaporates from the surface. As this happens, the droplet diameter gets smaller and a salt crust forms around the droplet. The water inside the salt crust begins to heat and boil and the internal pressure builds. The droplet then explodes and the water vapor left inside the droplet cools the surroundings. The remaining particles dehydrate and evaporate into a gas. And finally, the atoms of the elements in the particles must be converted to an ion by the removal of an electron from the outer shell of the atom. In ICPMS, we measure the ions of the elements on our sample that are created by the interaction of the gaseous elemental atoms with the argon plasma. Anything that changes the rate or degree of ionization of an elemental ion can cause a matrix interference. As the sample aerosol particles travel through the plasma, remember they only have about 12 milliseconds from the time they leave the tip of the injector to complete all of the various steps to become an ion. The aerosol droplets can also interact with one another and the water and argon present in the plasma. This slide just shows the various zones of the plasma and where these processes are occurring. Non-mass dependent matrix interferences generally occur in the nebulizer, spray chamber, and the early part of the ICP torch. Mass dependent or space charge interferences occur in the latter parts of the torch once the ions are formed and as the ion beam is carried into the interface of the ICPMS or into the mass spectrometer. Some interferences may be affected by the sampling depth, the distance between the end of the torch and the sampler cone, or the speed and flow of the nebulizer gas.
All of these processes are interdependent upon one another. Let us first talk about the formation of the sample aerosol by the nebulizer. The mean droplet size produced by a given nebulizer is described by the somewhat complicated Nukiyama and Tanizawa equation, which is shown on the slide. The key thing to remember here is that the diameter of an aerosol droplet, called the solder mean diameter, is proportional to the liquid viscosity and inversely proportional to the density. In addition, the diameter will also depend on both the gas flow rate as well as the liquid flow rate. The takeaway message here is that the aerosol diameter depends on the identity and character characteristics of your solution. So if your standards and samples have different characteristics, you will have different size droplets being produced, and these may not behave the same way as they travel through the ICP, causing a matrix interference. So why does this matter? Remember, the aerosol diameter affects many things. The transport efficiency to the plasma, the rate of desolvation and vaporization, and ultimately the production of the analyte ions that you are trying to measure in the ICPMS and your signal intensity. The aerosol diameter is not only impacted by the density and viscosity of the solution, but it also depends on the type of nebulizer you are using and the type of spray chamber. The aerosol diameter can depend on the concentration of the acid you are using as well. The chart below was taken from the research paper referenced at the bottom of the slide and shows that between deionized water and a solution containing 25% nitric acid, the particle mean diameter entering the plasma changes by nearly one micron. This can have a huge effect on what happens to those particles in the plasma, and just changing the gas flow rate or the nebulizer gas setting on your ICP can also have some effect on the aerosol and your analytical signals. In addition, the presence of volatile compounds in your sample matrix, such as hydrochloric acid or ethanol or methanol, which tend to form smaller droplets that are more easily atomized and ionized, can lead to signal enhancements. The analytical implication of this is seeing elevated results for these types of samples when compared to calibration curves prepared only in dilute nitric acid. I am often asked how closely should my calibration standard acid matrix match that of the samples and the wash solution. The simple answer is as close as possible. For some anal analyses, I have seen just a 2% difference in the nitric acid concentration cause matrix effects. As to the wash solution, many labs have a practice of using a more concentrated rinse solution to help eliminate analyte carryover in the sample introduction system, and this is sometimes necessary. However, one thing to be aware of if you do this is that it can take an extended period of time for the tertiary aerosol present in the spray chamber to stabilize if you are making drastic changes in the acid concentration. This slide shows the effect of changing from 2% nitric acid to 10% nitric acid, the solid line, and from 2% nitric acid to 25% nitric acid and back, the dotted line, on a mid-mass element or yttrium. In the case of a 2-10% to acid change, the signal takes about 50 seconds to stabilize, and in the case of going from 2-25% to nitric acid, that stabilization stabilization time is increased dramatically to over 200 seconds or three minutes. You need to be aware of this and take this into account in your analytical read delay times in your method. If you try to read the next sample after the wash too quickly, you will have poor RSDs on your replicates because the signal hasn't had enough time to stabilize. This is especially critical if you are also speeding up the peristaltic pump to quickly wash in or wash out the sample. As you increase the sample flow by speeding up the pump, you will decrease the plasma temperatures because you are putting more wet aerosol droplets into the plasma, and this will in turn cool the plasma temperature, which slows down all the processes that need to occur to form your ions of interest. So you may need to increase your read delay a bit to ensure you have a steady state signal before you begin making your analytical measurements. One diagnostic to keep an eye on is your replicate RSDs of both the analyte signals and your internal standards, and keep in mind they may not be behaving in the same way. You also need to be aware of the fact that different nebulizer and spray chamber combinations will have different characteristics. There are numerous 
combinations possible as the photos at the bottom of the slide indicate. Typically, the primary consideration is making sure your nebulizer and spray chamber are compatible with your sample matrix. For example, if you have hydrofluoric acid present, you can't use glass sample introduction systems. Generally, you want a sample introduction system that provides small droplets which are desolvated and vaporized faster than the large droplets. You also want to have a narrow size distribution so that the desolvation and vaporization processes are consistent and reproducible. I borrowed the figure in the upper right from a presentation given nearly 20 years ago comparing the aerosol mean diameter from two different nebulizers. In this case, a concentric Meinhardt TR30 nebulizer and a parallel path Miramis nebulizer, which are two commonly used nebulizers. As the results of this study show, the smallest aerosol droplet size for the Miramis nebulizer at 9 microns was slightly smaller than the 11 micron size droplets produced by the Meinhardt nebulizer. However, if you look at the size of the colored plots, which is indicative of the droplet size distribution, the Meinhardt or TR30 nebulizer produces a tighter or more consistent droplet size distribution. Although the Miramis parallel path nebulizer is often favored in high TDS applications for ICP OES because of its resistance to clogging, it is only rarely used in ICPMS, probably due to the larger aerosol size distribution, which could lead to more pronounced matrix effects. Let's talk next about how good the ICP is as an ion source. This is a general resource for you, and it was a little bit hard to find. In a bit, we will talk about easily ionizable elements. These are elements with low first ionization potentials. The typical EIE elements are over on the left-hand side of the periodic table, and as this table shows, they have fairly low first ionization potentials. Please also note that the argon first ionization potential is around 16 electron volts. Elements with first ionization potentials higher than argon are not ionized in the argon plasma, and elements in the 9 to 13 electron volt range are only partially ionized by an argon plasma. This slide might be a bit more useful and shows the actual degree of ionization of each element in the argon plasma. Please note these, that these are calculated estimates and will be affected by the plasma conditions and the temperature. However, in general, the argon ICP is pretty good as an ion source and is able to ionize most elements in the periodic table more than 80%. There are some elements, however, that are not well ionized. This is because these elements have high first ionization potentials. This is one of the reasons why some elements can't be determined by ICPMS or why some elements, such as arsenic and selenium, for example, are notorious for low signal levels and higher detection limits. Probably the most commonly encountered matrix interference is that of the EIE or easily ionizable element. EIEs are elements with very low first ionization potentials, and they are one of the most studied matrix interferences in both ICP OES and ICP MS. EIEs cause changes in the analytical signal because they modify the state of the analyte in the plasma. The plasma thermal characteristics or the analyte excitation efficiency and spatial distribution in the plasma. In short, the presence of an EIE can change the slope of your calibration curve, leading to an incorrect result if your sample matrix differs significantly from that of your calibration. The most commonly encountered EIEs are lithium, sodium, potassium, and cesium. Their interference effect is generally proportional to their ionization potential. In the next few slides, we will take a closer look at how an EIE matrix interference might look in some ICPMS data. But first, you need a little background information. One common application for ICPMS is the determination of trace elements in surface or drinking waters by EPA method 200.8. Since magnesium, calcium, sodium, and potassium are not listed in method 200.8, many labs do not even look for them by ICPMS. However, it is important for anyone doing method 200.8 to realize that all natural waters contain varying levels of these four elements, and the table on, the, on this slide shows some average concentrations. 
This is some data that I found on concentrations of major cations in drinking water around the U.S. I've grouped these according to general regions. As you can see, the average concentrations are on the order of 20 to 30 ppm sodium and calcium and 2 to 10 ppm potassium and magnesium. Remember that sodium and potassium are EIEs, or easily ionizable elements. Calcium is also a known matrix interference because it changes the time it takes for an aerosol droplet to be vaporized in the plasma. Also note that the total mean concentration of these four major cations in drinking water is around 65 ppm, which really isn't all that high, but in the slides that follow you will show that this actually has an effect. So remember at the beginning of the presentation I mentioned that a matrix interference can be identified by a change in the slope of your calibration curve with and without the matrix present. In this slide, I compared a calibration curve prepared in just 1% nitric acid to one where I added increasing levels of the five major cations typically found in natural or drinking waters to the highest three calibration standards. The levels of matrix added are given on the slide, but the highest calibration standard contained only 50 ppm calcium and sodium, and 10 ppm magnesium and potassium and silicon, which are not all that unusual for a clean surface water. If you look at the plots comparing the no matrix given in the blue boxes and with the matrix, the red boxes, you see that for copper, the matrix suppresses the calibration curve by 15%. In the same standards, the silver calibration curve is suppressed by nearly 40%. This difference in suppression between copper and silver indicate that there is probably more than one type of matrix interference occurring. This is generally the case. In this slide, I compare the zinc calibrations with and without the matrix in two different modes, no collision gas or standard mode and with a collision gas, helium, to remove molecular interferences. As you can see, we have a slight difference between the two. This might be indicative of some sort of other type of interference occurring as the ions enter the collision or reaction cell of the ICPMS or a space charge effect. However, it is important to realize that just adding the matrix to my calibration standards depressed the zinc calibration by over 20%. So the biggest problem is how to recognize that you have a matrix interference such as an EIE effect occurring. In ICPMS, the biggest clue is when your internal standard or analyte intensities vary greatly for a particular sample, especially a sample that has a different matrix than your calibration standards. In this example, the calibration was performed with no matrix in 1% nitric acid and all elements were calibrated from 1 to 100 part per billion. When a check standard called the ICV was prepared at 75 part per billion in just nitric acid, all is well, as the green highlighted percent recoveries indicate. However, when typical levels of the major cations that might be found in a natural water are added to this very same ICV check standard, all is suddenly not well. Some of the elements are okay and some are not. The elements that are good within plus or minus 10% recovery shaded in green, have more similar first ionization potentials to that of the internal standard being used. So just a reminder about internal standards in ICPMS. They are primarily used to compensate for changes in sample introduction uptake rates due to changes in sample viscosity and tubing wear as well as intensity changes due to changes in the interface cone orifices due to sample deposition over time. They might be able to be used to compensate for matrix interferences, but not always. And if the interference is an EIE effect, you will have to match the ionization potentials as well as compensate for other changes occurring due to the sample matrix, such as aerosol particle size and vaporization rates or completeness. This is nearly impossible to do for every element in a multi-elemental analysis where you have 20 to 30 elements present. There are too many competing effects all going on at the same time. There is also no perfect internal standard that will work for everything in every matrix all the time. The chart on the right hand side of this slide shows that the internal standards are behaving differently from one solution to another. 
particularly in the highest calibration standard where the concentrations of the four major cations, sodium, potassium, magnesium, and calcium, are the highest. The best way to try and identify and correct for matrix interferences using your internal standards is to include alternate internal standards so you can reprocess data with a different internal standard to see what happens to the results. I would encourage those of you who operate using method SOPs to build in some flexibility into your SOPs to allow such things as reprocessing or you will end up pulling out a lot of hair trying to make sure that just a few internal standards work for a wide variety of sample types. And this includes those of you just running drinking water. Because surface and drinking waters are impacted by the geology of the area where the water originates, you can have varying amounts of the EIE elements present as well as other major cations in waters all the time. To illustrate this alternate internal standard approach, I generally include two or three additional suitable internal standard elements in my method and in my internal standard solution. The next test in troubleshooting is to reprocess the exact same data with different internal standards. In this slide, keep in mind that this is all the exact same raw data, just reprocessed with different internal standards. On the top set of data, I used germanium as the internal standard. In the middle set of data, I used rhodium, and on the bottom set, I use iridium. When I don't have any matrix elements such as sodium, potassium, magnesium, or calcium present, in my ICV check standard, it doesn't really matter which internal standard I use, all is well. However, if I have the ICV or the check standard with the 25 ppm sodium and calcium and the 5 ppm magnesium and potassium and silicon present, we see something different. You see that some elements pass my control limits and others do not. Hopefully this illustrates that there is no perfect internal standard and that you should build some flexibility into your SOPs when it comes to using different internal standards for different sample types or at least allow the data to be recalculated using a different internal standard to see what effect that alternate internal standard will have on your results. So some things to keep in mind as you are trying to troubleshoot a method problem that more than likely is resulting from a matrix interference effect. Matrix effects occur when the elemental composition in the sample matrix changes. This causes the size of the droplets to change and affects the ionization of the elements in the plasma. This in turn causes the slope of the calibration curve to be different for your standards than it would be for your sample matrix. This is because the analyte or internal standard signals or both are changing. A general rule of thumb for ICPMS is that depending on the elements present, matrix effects can occur with even 50 to 100 ppm of total major cation concentrations, such as sodium, potassium, magnesium, and calcium. Hopefully the examples in the last few slides have il illustrated this. Keep in mind that this is just some guidance to be aware of when you see strange things happening. It's not a hard and fast rule and could be different for your ICPMS and how you have it set up and for your sample introduction system and the matrices that you are using for calibration standards and your samples. Sometimes the best possible solution is to try and matrix match the standards to your samples to minimize or eliminate these effects. To illustrate the power of matrix matching, let's go back to that previous data I showed you. Although one suggestion I made at the time was to reprocess the data with different internal standards, you might be thinking, I don't have time to reprocess all my sample data with different internal standards to see if things will change. Or maybe you aren't allowed to per your standard operating procedures. If this is the case, there is something relatively simple you can do, particularly in a high throughput lab where samples are of one or a few different general types, and that is to matrix match your calibration standards to your samples. It's really not that hard provided you know something about the major constituents of your sample or can find out about them. Here is the same data for that no matrix ICV and the matrix ICV when I used my matrix calibration, the one that I showed you on the calibration plot showing how the matrix suppressed the calibration curves. 
In this case, you see that it doesn't matter which internal standard I pick or whether the major cations were present in my check standard or not. I get plus good plus or minus 10% recoveries. By adding the major cations to the calibration, I am essentially matrix matching the calibration to the samples. This minimizes the EIE effects and the selection of internal standard becomes much less critical. The lesson here is that it's easier to matrix match than it is to find the perfect internal standard because the internal standard can't compensate for everything at the same time. If you don't know much about your sample matrix, the simplest way to matrix match is to perform a method of standard additions calibration where you spike increasing amounts of your standards into separate aliquots of your sample, or a standard additions calibration where you use a typical sample as the matrix. This is often done in a clinical lab using a pooled blood, urine, or serum sample for the calibration matrix. In some cases, although this can be time consuming, it's less time consuming than constantly rerunning samples or pulling your hair out trying to find the perfect internal standard to fix everything. Besides matrix matching, let's talk about some other strategies that can also be used to reduce or eliminate matrix interferences. Another thing to think about when you think you have a matrix interference problem is plasma loading. More sample is not necessarily better. If you overload the plasma with too much sample or solvent, the plasma will be cooler and have less energy to overcome matrix effects. Also, putting too much sample in can change the droplet size distribution produced. Each nebulizer has an optimal sample uptake rate, and you need to pay attention to this. Too high a sample flow can cause larger aerosol droplets that take longer to desolvate and eventually ionize. This will increase your matrix effects. It's actually better to starve the nebulizer in most cases and run less sample flow to it. This leads to smaller droplets which are easier to desolvate. Remember, based on the nebulizer gas flow and the distance between the tip of the injector to the sample cone, you have about 12 milliseconds or less to desolvate, vaporize, atomize, and ionize the elements in your sample. One thing that is often done to reduce matrix effects is to run robust plasma conditions. This gives a hotter plasma. This is achieved by increasing your RF power, decreasing your sample uptake rate, and moving the torch away from the interface one to two millimeters. This slows things down and allows the plasma more time to deal with the matrix interferences and ionize the elements in your sample. Another way to reduce matrix effects is to use gas dilution. In the Nexian ICPMS systems, this is called AMS or the all matrix solution. AMS is a special spray chamber with a gas addition port on the neck of the spray chamber and a mass flow controller and gas line to add a small flow of argon to the neck of the spray chamber to dilute the aerosol before it goes into the injector, as is shown as in the figure on the right. This leads to more efficient ionization, fewer matrix effects, and less deposition on the cones, and therefore less drift. Using AMS on the Nexian ICPMS, the dilution level is variable and user selectable, giving a predictable response across the mass range. It will also improve the long term stability, as the chart on the bottom shows, where spikes have been analyzed in an undiluted seawater matrix. However, please keep in mind that the use of use of any gas dilution accessory, such as AMS, will also dilute the entire aerosol stream. Both the matrix and your analyte intensities will generally be reduced. So you need to balance the amount of gas dilution you use with your detection limit needs and perform your detection limit studies using the AMS gas dilution level you plan on using for your samples. In the earlier work where I showed the matrix effects on the check standard recoveries and the calibration curve suppression, the use of AMS can improve the stability of the internal standards and improve overall long-term stability. The plot on the left-hand side of this slide is without AMS where the internal standards drift over the course of a run. The plot on the right shows the same analytical sequence when AMS is used AMS resulted in less overall drift in the internal standards and the QCs remaining stable for a longer period of time during my analytical run. 
Okay, we're getting pretty close to our time here, but I do want to talk just a few minutes about space charge matrix interferences. Space charge interferences are generally occurring when you see some sort of mass dependence on an interference effect. For example, the signal enhancement or suppression is different for high or low mass elements. Space charge effects are generally attributed to conditions that change the ion density through the sample, sampler and skimmer cones and or the focusing of the ion lenses in the mass spectrometer. If the ion density is low, such as the figure on the left, in a diluted sample, the ionic radii do not overlap and the ion flow through the hole in the sampler and the skimmer cones flow independently with the gas flow or the nebulizer gas setting. If you have high ion density, the ionic radii will overlap and the ions will start to be affected by the electrical field of the neighboring ions. The electrons will be migrating away from the center of the ion beam due to higher mobility because they are smaller than the ions. This results in a net positive charge along the axis, creating a positive space charge field. A classic example of a space charge effect is the analysis of a low mass element such as lithium or beryllium in a high mass matrix such as lead or uranium. The higher mass lead or uranium ions push the smaller low mass ions out of the way, leading to what looks like a signal suppression. One of the easiest things you can do to avoid a space charge interference is to dilute your sample so you have a low ion density going through your sampler and skimmer cone and into your ion optics. The important thing to be able to recognize is that if your matrix interference appears to be mass dependent, you might have a space charge interference occurring. The overall instrument design of the ICPMS system can affect the severity of these types of interferences and there is generally a combination of different effects taking place on the ion beam as it travels through the sampler cones and your ion optics into the mass spectrometer. This is why the various voltages on some of the components inside the vacuum chamber may need to be adjusted from time to time, and this is generally a part of the daily tuning procedure for your ICPMS instrument. The triple cone interface, along with the quadrupole ion deflector on the Nexian, which turns the ion beam 90 degrees before entering the universal cell, are a part of the design of the Nexian ICPMS systems that serve to minimize these types of interferences. The ability to scan the voltages on the quadrupole ion deflector is a part of the Nexian design to maximize ion transmission for each mass as it passes into the mass spectrometer, and this will minimize space charge interferences. Other ICPMS systems typically optimize their ion lenses on a mid-mass element such as indium or rhodium. If you look at this plot of ion transmissions for a variety of masses and focus on the low and high mass extremes, you will see that if I use the voltage that best transmits a mid-mass element, I lose a lot of the signal for the lower and high mass elements. This will decrease your sensitivity for these masses and affect your detection limits. In the QID or quadrupole ion deflector of a Nexian system, the deflector voltage is scanned to maximize the ion transmission for each mass as it enters the mass spectrometer, and this serves to minimize space charge interferences. In the Nexian ICPMS systems, the hyperskimmer resamples the ion beam as it leaves the skimmer leaving the ion beam tightly focused as it enters the QID, which turns the ion beam 90 degrees. As part of your daily tuning procedure, you do a QID optimization, which sets up the voltage scanning algorithm that changes the voltage on the QID deflector for each mass entering the mass spectrometer. This serves to maximize the ion transmission across the mass range and reduce space charge effects. One thing to consider if you think you have a significant space charge interference is to perform your QID optimization in a matrix more similar to your sample matrix. Although we rarely need to do this, it is another tool in your toolbox to have at your disposal to investigate and potentially solve a matrix interference. So we are about out of time for today, so let's do a quick review of our matrix interference toolbox.
First of all, anytime you don't get the expected answer and you've made your standards and samples correctly, suspect a matrix interference. However, most of the problems I see from different users are actually the result of poor calibrations, either due to contaminated calibration blanks, which is the most important point in your calibration curve, or improperly prepared calibration standards. It's worth noting that if you've been in a cycle of constantly recalibrating, that you need to realize it takes longer than you think, sometimes as long as 10 or 15 minutes, depending on your high calibration standard level, to completely wash out that high calibration standard back down to a level that you can use it for your calibration blank. Be alert for matrix interferences anytime your calibration matrix and your acid content is different from your unknown or your QC samples, and yes, 1-2% to difference in acid concentration can matter. And this includes elements that are there that you aren't looking for, such as the sodium in a brine or serum sample or the lithium in a fusion matrix. Be alert for anything that can change the viscosity or density of your calibration solutions or your samples especially the presence of an organic solvent in the sample. And finally, pay attention to the things that can change the sample delivery flow rate, such as using self-aspiration, worn pump tubing, or viscosity changes in your sample solutions. Just a quick note that it has also been long observed that the presence of organics in samples can cause signal enhancement for some analytes in ICPMS. This is particularly important for those doing determinations of arsenic and selenium. You can see significant signal enhancement due to the presence of organics. Typically, or we are talking about the presence of carbon, either as an organic solvent or if you have a high TOC or DOC level in the sample. The paper listed here discusses the causes and extent of those types of interferences, but the short explanation is that the carbon in the sample acts as an electron sink and it helps to promote the ionization of the arsenic and selenium, which have high first ionization potentials, which if you remember are not well ionized in an argon plasma. So adding carbon to your sample matrix will help ionize these, these two elements a little bit better. Now let's review a few of the tests you can perform to determine if you have a matrix interference. First, you need to know if it's all elements being affected or just some. If just a few elements, what do those elements have in common, if anything? Look at their ionization potentials, mass, internal standard assignment, etc. Is the problem in all the samples or just some? What is different about the samples that have the problem versus the samples that don't? A very simple test, and sometimes the solution you can perform, is to dilute the sample, 2x, 5x, 10x, etc., to see if things improve. I usually compare two different dilution levels to see if one affects the results more than the other. Be cognizant of your detection limit and comparing results for elements that you may have diluted below your method detection limit. You can also reprocess data with different or no internal standards to see if that makes any effect on your sample results. You can also do a semi-quantitative analysis for the Nexians, we call this total quant, to try and identify other constituents in your samples, particularly ones you are not looking for, such as EIE elements that may be causing a matrix interference. Now let's summarize some of the actions we can take if you suspect you have a matrix interference. Possibly the easiest thing you can do would be to dilute the sample to minimize the matrix effect. Again, you need to be aware of your detection or reporting limits because generally you should multiply your reporting limit by the sample dilution factor. Next, you can try matrix matching your calibration standards to your sample. In the example I showed you, I used an increasing amount of my matrix cations in my top three calibration standards to build the matrix interference into my calibration curve. If you have one or two predominant sample types, this can be fairly straightforward to implement. I used to have a different calibration for my water matrices compared to my rock matrices. If you have a wide variety of sample types, you can also do this using a method of standard additions calibration type where the calibration standards are spiked to separate aliquots of each sample, or a batch matrix is spiked using an additions calibration. 
The additions calibration is usually done by clinical labs where calibration is done in a pooled matrix of each sample type, such as blood, serum, or urine. You can also try reprocessing the data with a different internal standard. This requires building in some flexibility into your methods and including potential alternative internal standards into your methods as well as your calibration and sample data collection processes, unless you want to change things and then have to rerun the samples. You can also try using AMS or gas dilution to minimize the matrix effects. In many cases, a little AMS and partial matrix matching can work quite well. Another thing to try would be to reduce plasma loading or cooling of the plasma by the sample by decreasing your sample uptake rate. In general, most of the Nexian ICPMS systems will have reduced matrix interferences if you keep your sample uptake rate less than 200 microliters per minute. And finally, you can also try using robust conditions, which is a higher plasma power, low sample flow, and move the torch back away from the interface, which gives more time for all of those plasma processes to occur. Remember, when you're doing these things to affect your results and identify what your matrix interference might be to only change one thing at a time to see what effect it has. This will help you develop the experience what works and what doesn't for your particular instrument and your sample types. And finally, I'd like to make a couple rather simple summary statements. First of all, if you are able to get a signal and construct a calibration curve but are not getting the expected results on samples and or QC samples, the instrument, meaning the hardware, is not broken. Generally, 95% of the time, the weird results are due to something else. Matrix interferences are often the culprit, but unrecognized by a lot of users of ICPMS with many years experience. Hopefully today's talk has given you an understanding of what they are, how they can occur, and how to test for them in addition to some ways to mitigate their effects on your results. And finally, before we leave you today and answer some questions, the study of matrix effects in ICPMS is a complex subject, and we are still understanding the chemistry and physics behind many of these. While I didn't have a lot of time to go into details, this reference paper does an excellent job of reviewing these types of interferences specifically for ICPMS, and it's a good place for you to begin to gain more of an understanding about these interferences. This final reference is another good reference on the subject of matrix interferences. Although it was written for ICP AES, the exact same effects occur in ICP MS because, as I mentioned, most of these interferences occur in the nebulizer, spray chamber, and the plasma, which are essentially the same in both techniques. And finally, I'd like to thank everyone for attending today's webinar on, on matrix interferences in ICPMS, and if you'd like to download today's presentation, you can do that by clicking on the Handouts tab and selecting the items available that you wish to download. And now I'd be happy to try and answer any questions you may have. All right. Well, thank you, Ruth. That was fantastic. Um, I know we're at the top of the hour, but uh, we have a few questions uh, that have come in in the Q&A, so hopefully some of you can stick around for the question and answer period here. Um, all right. Um, so, uh, first question. Um, any advice about argon chloride interferences with arsenic in standard mode? I'm assuming that's for EPA 200.8 in particular, which uh, doesn't allow the use of a cell. Because ideally, collision works really well, uh, or reaction cells. But uh, um, yeah, in standard mode, um, Ruth, are you, you're still here? <laughs> 
I'm here. Okay. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I mean, center mode, I mean, it, it is always a, a pain, the argon chloride, especially if the chlorides in your samples are variable, right? Uh, Ruth can probably agree. I mean, it's, uh, yep. you know, if it's variable, it's a, it's a bit of a pain because really all you have in standard mode is matrix matching. Um, for the most part, and you can use equations, right? Uh, they have, there's, there's more, you know, error with equations to correct for that, you know, relatively larger interference sometimes depending on the chloride levels. Um, but um, yeah, when, when the chloride is considerably variable from sample to sample, there can be some problems, um, uh, you know, having a consistent correction. Any other tips there, uh, Ruth? Yeah, I, I guess I, I usually monitor the chloride, um, one of the two chlorine isotopes and kind of monitor the count levels. And if I have samples that really significantly vary from where, where I had my calibration standards and the most of the samples, you can dilute the sample, do a one to two dilution on the sample and make sure that you know, you're getting consistent answers. Um, Good point. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Uh, especially in some unknow unknowns. Yeah, that might be the way to go. Um, the next question is: How often is it recommended to replace mixing teas? Um, is it within a certain time frame, number of samples, depending on sample type. Uh, <laughs> you know, there's a, a few questions built in there. Uh, kind of proper cleaning extend this lifespan. I mean, they kind of answered their own question. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, rinsing out after you know high samples, making sure you do a good 15, 20 minute rinse with with your clean acid matrix before you shut everything down uh, will help preserve the life. You don't want to let things precipitate out in the sample tea. Um, if you have had a issues with silver and low levels of hydrochloric acid precipitating silver chloride out, uh, that might be a good time to replace the tea. Uh, if you can't get your your silver backgrounds back down, um, mm -hmm. it, it, mm -hmm. it's really dependent too on some elements. I mean, if you're looking for elements that are sticky like boron and thallium, they like to hang on to plastic, you might have to replace it sooner rather than later. Um, so, you know, I, I would say maybe once a year for sure, if, if, you know, you're using one of the more expensive teas and you may find, depending on your samples, you might have to do it a little more frequently, but definitely rinsing well. Um, I, what I find they, that one's nice is the in the valve based mixing. Sometimes that that's nice because you can clean that, that valve, right? Yeah. If, if you have a a fast or a valving system like a fast or a prep fast yeah mixing it in the valve at least it can you know can can clean it sometimes a little bit easier because you can disassemble it right that's what i just find um yeah and then um next question you know, what characteristics should we look for when choosing an, an internal standard, uh, ionization potential or mass? <laughs> I, I kind of try to balance both. So usually I have, you know, internal standards at, at, at low, medium and high masses. But, you know, if I find that I'm having an issue with one or two elements, then I might take a look at the ionization potential and, and try and change, uh, internal standard. Uh, when I did geochemical analysis, uh, we pretty much looked at the entire periodic table and, and we usually used uh, rhodium and iridium for almost the entire periodic table. So, um, And you also need to make sure that your internal standard is not present in your samples in any uh, significant level. So, you know, you want to make sure that you're, if you have a natural level of something like scandium or germanium in the samples, you need to spike your internal standard in there so that you're not seeing uh, high enough. So you're not seeing f uh, fluctuations from the natural level in the samples. So, yeah. 
Good point. Yeah, good point. Yeah, I mean, I, I use a, a mix of mass and ionization potential as well. It really kind of depends what, what works best for that particular set of analytes and then the matrix. Um, how does the pergo humidifier affect nebulization and matrix effects? So the PERGO, um, the purpose of the PERGO, which is an argon humidifier system to humidify your nebulizer argon, and uh, some cases we have a two-channel argon mm -hmm. humidification that humidifies the AMS gas as well. What those two things do is, is they keep dry aerosol particles from building up on the inside capillary of the nebulizer and partially clogging your nebulizer because uh, some drift especially in internal standards and intensities when you're doing long runs is actually because you're partially clogging your nebulizer over time especially if you have a high tds samples um, the pergo has some adds water vapor to that dry argon that goes into the nebulizer and the little micro droplets of water go into the nebulizer tip and and keep uh, things from precipitating. Same thing if you're humidifying the AMS gas. Um, in that case, it helps keep the tip of your injector clean. Um, mm -hmm. There have been some studies done back in the 90s that actually adding a little humidification to the aerosol gas stream helps the RF field couple better with the plasma and, and can help uh, eliminate some of the matrix effects and break apart molecular species better uh, while your your gaseous atoms and molecules are going going through the plasma so um, it, it can have some uh, pretty positive effects on on your results mm -hmm. so yeah the, the big one is the uh, uh, avoiding the precipitation of you know salts and so forth on the nebulizer definitely yeah. Um, um, okay, there's a couple more questions here. Uh, no, I thank a couple of people. Thank you for your presentation. <laughs> I'm just making my way through. So um, for Nexian, do you observe stability issues when the quadrupline deflector doesn't look like the shape shown on the slide? It may end up looking more like a linear line. Um, I haven't observed many stability issues. Every once in a while, you'll see your, your QID calibration curve doesn't look quote unquote normal. Um, typically in the Nexian, it, it looks, I, I call it the, the lazy S where it's kind of a slight a shape, um, you know, tilted like, I don't know, 35 degrees or something. Um, if you get a weird looking QID, one thing I would do is make sure that your cell entrance and exit voltages are set right and your, uh, um, uh, what is it, CR? CRO. Your, yeah, your CRO is uh, uh, set right. Uh, so do those optimizations and redo it and maybe redo it a couple of times to make sure that it it is consistent, that you get this consistent result. I have seen weird things happen with a QID if you have like a little air bubble that happens uh, while you're doing the QID optimization and that can really throw it off. So the first thing I would do is if it looks weird, just repeat it a couple times and make sure that uh, um, right? you get the same thing and that it's not just an artifact of something that happened during your nebulization process. Yeah, good point. Yeah. If any, if any optimization looks weird, yeah, you should repeat it for sure. Yeah. Um, um, I had a question from somebody that said, asked, when will the webinar about spectroscopy interferences be? <laughs> I guess I think they mean <laughs> spectral interferences, right? That's a, they're asking. Yep. yep. Um, not sure when I might do one. I think we've done a couple different webinars that are available uh, up on the on demand. Yeah, yeah, and that, that's what I was going to mention. Actually, I have this slide uh -huh. up on the on the link there, and everybody here will get an email, uh, you know, with the link as well. And I think they did. Um, just you know, go to this. We have some on demand, and we do talk about some of the spectral interferences. 
um, encountered in, in both OES and MS. Um, so you know, feel free to go through on demand. And if, there, if there's missing anything, you have any topics or suggestions, you know, reach out, reach out to me, and uh, we'll try and put together something on that uh, topic um, for sure. Uh, I guess one more, one more question here, Ruth. Um, yep. Does calibrating using simple linear versus linear through zero yield better results? <laughs> it, it, it can sometimes, and that depends on the your um, upper linear range. So if you're trying to do something like calibrate fairly high, like in ICPMS, 100 ppb or higher is fairly high, yep. um, and get accurate results for things that are, let's say, less than 10 ppb, um, you're probably going to uh, be much better off if you use a weighted linear calibration. Uh, because that puts more weight on your low calibration standards. Keep in mind that if you're doing a linear through zero calibration, the, the response from that highest calibration standard pretty much determines the slope of your curve. So, yeah. um, you know, and especially if you have a matrix interference occurring in that high matrix calibration or standard, and it's suppressing your curve that will throw all of your low concentration elements way off or yeah, if it's enhancing uh, the upper one so it's i, it's I agree i mean I, just to you know look at the effect of different curve types yeah yeah and it really depends on your working range where you know where you're normally seeing your samples come in um, what your quality control is. I, ICPMS is an inherently linear technique, right? But uh, but there are effects, as discussed today, that can can affect the the response, right? Um, so yeah, so you you may sometimes some people even have um, they run it twice. They run a low calibration and a high calibration. Essentially, the same analyte is run just once but it's applied to both curves separately. That's an, another way of, of doing it as well. Um, yeah, just, just you know, be, be cautious about sometimes the high can really bias the low end of the, the curve, uh, for sure. But if, again, they also, you know, if conversely, if you use a weighted linear, it's biasing it towards the low end, so the high might be, uh, yeah. showing a little bit off or quality control at the higher concentrations it might be a little bit more off but the lower concentration quality control will be better so all right well thank uh, everybody for joining again uh, feel free to check out this uh, URL here to locate all the webinars in this series and uh, you know, as an attendee, you'll get uh, emails on uh, future um, webinars as well. And so thank you, Ruth. That was fantastic. And thank everybody for attending today's webinar. If you have any other questions, please reach out to us. Uh, once you leave today's webinar, you'll receive a survey on the presentation. And we'd appreciate if you complete that and provide your feedback. You will also receive a follow-up email within about 24 hours with a link to view the recording of today's webinar. So on behalf of Park and Elmer and our presenter, thank you for joining us today and have a great rest of your day. Thanks a lot.